Anyway, Leviticus 26. We've been going through a little short uh, pseudo series of fun lessons uh, just to, to enjoy our Bible a little bit. Last week we went through Deuteronomy 32, uh, which we don't explore Deuteronomy a whole lot. This week, Leviticus 26. And so I don't know when the last time you read through Leviticus 26, maybe not there through your year in the Bible calendar yet. But uh, it is an interesting chapter and an important chapter in Israel's history. So I thought we'd spend some time there just having some fun talking about Israel's curses, as sad as that is. Uh, it is important for our understanding to, to know why God did the things that he did in Israel's history. Many people think that in Israel's history, God was up there on his uh, heavenly throne, randomly throwing lightning bolts, which is the Greek and the pagan idea of how God operates. In the Bible, God has a plan and a purpose, which he articulates to people and then tells people what he's doing and then follows through with what he said. Wow. What a concept. So the God of integrity and righteousness actually does that. And so we see in Leviticus, as we'll study today, that God told Israel in their covenant what he would do if they responded to him a certain way. And through the history from Leviticus all the way to the apostles, we'll see that God actually did exactly what he told them he would do. And so there was no surprise. There was no mystery. It was all written right there in, in the stone in, in the covenant. Okay, And it also helps you, I think, to try to put together the scripture a little bit. It's not a random collection of stories and events. These are things that occurred according, and are inspired in the scripture, according to what God said would happen. So they're there to actually verify God's truthfulness and God's faithfulness, the fact that he actually does what he says he's going to do. You see, so it's interesting. It also exemplifies for us, as we see the nature of what we're studying, God said there'll be curses and punishments on people, uh, it also shows us the nature of man, which, of course, uh, s sadly, is that we're, they were sinners, we're sinners, that uh, when they're confronted with God's covenant and law, cannot be justified. And so what we see in Israel's history is constantly punishment and wrath from God interspersed with times of grace and mercy where God pleads with them not to break his covenant because he is beholden to do what he said he would do, which was to punish them. Okay, so uh, we'll cover that today uh, in Leviticus. I've al also always tempted you guys to um, tell me to study through Leviticus on Tuesdays, and no one's ever responded to me about that. Um, I, I think it's a wonderful book in that uh, there's a lot of good chapters in there. If you've not studied the sacrifices and the different sacrifices and what they mean and the shadows that they represent, it's a wonderful study. If you haven't studied um, the, the clean and unclean things that God dictated to Israel and why he did that, it's a wonderful study. The holy days in Israel's history are in Leviticus. The priestly activities in Leviticus, and in this chapter specifically, it's the blessings and the curses in God's covenant given to Israel. That's what we're studying today. So Leviticus, uh, just a short preface here, is a religious book. I say that knowing what I'm saying. The Bible, and specifically the epistles given to the church today, are not religious in the idea that a religion is how man uh, performs to appease God and to uh, satisfy his wrath or his justice, right? Or try to gain his favor or assuage his wrath. This is a religion. Um, we do not participate in religion today. There's nothing you can do to satisfy God's wrath today, right? And there's nothing God has instructed for you to do to earn his favor today. So there's literally nothing you can do, and thus we don't operate in a religion. Christianity, as biblically taught, is not a religion. It's a faith. And you've maybe heard that before, but faith is in words. It's in substance. And so God has revealed to us a message of his grace and said, I've done all the work needed to save you. You trust my finished work, which is grace because I'm giving it to you on your behalf. And you trust my finished work, and then you can have salvation as a result. There's nothing left for you to do. Thus, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, salvation is by grace through faith, not of works. It's the gift of God. It's not of yourselves, right? Unless any man should boast. And so this uh, operation from God is not, I say that in, in contrast to Leviticus, is not how God had revealed in Leviticus for Israel to operate. In Leviticus, under the covenant, God had, had required them to do things in order to assuage his wrath. And if they did not do them, his wrath would be forthcoming. That's a religion, and this is the only instituted religion that God ever gave was to Israel. And we're smack dab in the third book of the Bible, right in the middle of Israel's religion. So Leviticus is a religious book where God tells Israel how to be holy before him. Now, unfortunately, there's too many people in Christendom, however you want to call it, 
that are stuck in the religion of the Bible, and thus in Leviticus and other law books, Exodus and Deuteronomy, and Numbers, and so forth. Okay, thinking that they need to present themselves holy to God. And thus they're looking for ways to do that. And Leviticus gives them ample ways of doing it, right? As does Numbers and Deuteronomy. And so I just want to guard with our lesson this morning that we're not going to Leviticus for any sort of personal instruction, okay, as far as uh, God telling us what to do. We have to ask the question as dispensational Bible students, is God speaking to us in this context? And Leviticus is not God speaking to you. All scripture is profitable for you, but there's times where God's not speaking to you. And there's times that he is. We have to ask that question. Okay? He's not speaking to us, the church, the body of Christ, in Leviticus. It's to Israel. Okay? Leviticus then contains, being a religious book, talking about holiness or how they can be holy before him, the holy things of God. Holy is a main word in Leviticus all throughout the book. Some 90 times it's used. Um, it talks about a holy God and how he requires holy men. Uh, priests being included in that, holy men, right? Holy sacrifices, the right and wrong way to give them. Holy places, where to go, where not to go, right? Holy food, <laughs> so you have clean and unclean food. Uh, holy days, that's where we get the word holiday, right? Holy days, there's a whole chapter on what ho holy days were in Israel. And holy prayers, and so how to pray to make yourself holy, and thus included in this, as we'll cover today a little bit, is confession, Right? This is how you assuage God's wrath in, in the biblical religion. Not according to Christianity and God's grace, but according to religion, what do you do? You say a holy prayer to God, confessing your sins. And it says in Leviticus that when you confess your sins, God will remember his promises of mercy and grace and will forgive your sins. This is what Leviticus teaches. How holy men can use holy sacrifices in a holy place on holy days with holy food and offer holy prayers and present themselves holy to God and God will accept them. Right? You, hopefully you can see in all that I've said there, no mention of Jesus Christ, of course. Where according to God's grace revelation, according to what Paul teaches us in Ephesians 1, Jesus Christ is how we're made accepted with God. Not a holy place, not a holy men, not a holy food, not a holy prayer. Nothing about us is holy. It's Jesus Christ who was sanctified on our behalf. And his finished work allows us to be accepted by God, not by what we've done, but what he's done. We get put in him, you see. So very different teaching. I'm just saying all that to line us up for a nice, fun study this morning, to remind us not to get caught up as if Leviticus is talking to us. It was the priest's responsibility. The reason why it's called Leviticus is because it's talking to uh, the Levites, right? Or not talking to them, it's talking to the nation, but it's for the Levites uh, and their responsibility because uh, it was their responsibility to clean up the nation. So all these holy instructions here, it was the priest's duty to present these to the nation and say, this is how you need to present yourself. And so in Israel's religion, you can look at the nation and say, if the nation's not clean, who you look to first as the, as the people who have the problem? Priests. Well, why aren't they doing what they're supposed to do? You know, because they're given that duty to present the nation. That's what priests are supposed to do. They represent men before God, right? Which is why you don't need a priest today, because who represents you before God? Jesus Christ. So see, Leviticus is totally out of touch with what God is doing today. But back then, it would be needed. Uh, Leviticus 26 specifically details the covenantal consequences. Uh, the first five books of your Bible called the Torah and the Hebrew, the, the biblical religion, the Israel's religion, uh, detail the laws. So Genesis is the beginning of the nation. Exodus is the deliverance of, of the nation and their laws. Uh, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, then are the fulfillment of these laws, detailing them, right? Which is why uh, many people, sadly, skip over these books because it's just too dry. And who likes to study law? Not all of us, right? But there's very interesting stuff in here. Leviticus 26, then, is, is the specific part of the law that lists the consequences to people's behavior according to the law. If they obeyed, certain things would happen. If they did not, certain things would happen. Thus, blessings and curses, right? That's what we find in Leviticus 26. The chapter is made up of 46 verses. 13 of them concern the promised blessings if they behave according to the covenant. 26 of promised curses if they don't. And then 7 of a promised rest at the very end. We'll cover all the sections, hopefully. Okay? And also, we'll see as we study through this, that due to Psalm 14, 2 and 3, which I know you have in the forefronts of your minds, right? Which has to do with God looking on the sons of men and not finding any good. Paul quotes it, says, there's none good, there's none righteous, there's none that understand, there's none that seeketh after God. That's Psalms. Paul quotes it in Romans 3, which is a good foundation for the gospel of grace, but it's quoting Psalms. David writes Psalms after the law was given, right? 
And so after God gives the law, the law showing people their knowledge of sin, proving that no man is perfect, no man can keep it, David writes, God looked down at men, including Israel, and said, there's none that understands. There's none that are righteous. Okay. And due to that, Leviticus 26, which details the ob obligations between God and man, okay, when Israel, as sinners, not seeking God, not obeying God, what do you think is going to happen in their history? Exactly what Leviticus 26 says. What's my point? So when you read Leviticus 26, yes, you're reading something given at Mount Sinai, you're get, reading something old in the law, but you're also reading a prophecy of Israel's future history because God's saying, if you don't obey me, this is what I'm going to do. And God's faithful. And so you keep reading in the Bible, and whoa, God did what he said he was going to do over and over again. And you see this timeline in Israel's history of what's going on. <clears throat> it's this timeline that stretches all the way from Mount Sinai all the way to Peter and the apostles, even to Revelation. Right? So this isn't just something in a small time in Israel's history. This details the entire history of Israel from beginning to end. So it's very fascinating in the prophetic sense of the study. Okay, so we'll be talking about some of that as well. All right, okay. Ready? Let's go. 46 verse, Leviticus 26 verse 1. <clears throat> you shall make you no idols uh, nor graven image, neither rear up a standing image, neither shall you set up any image of stone in your land to bow down unto it, for I am the Lord your God. This is uh, a reference, of course, to the, the idolatry commandment, not to commit idolatry, not to have the graven images. Uh, people naturally like to build up these stone images of themselves and their false gods. Uh, we have them in America, uh, not only pagan gods, but all over in our government structures, if you notice, they look very much like Greek temples. You notice this in America? Our, our, our position, our, the state capital of Indiana, our national capital of Washington, D.C., are made architecturally after the Roman and Greek temples, religious temples. And so it's interesting. You know, people always wear suits in these temples, don't they? See politicians walk in there, they're all dressed up, right? And people walk into those places, these sacred grounds, right? And there's certain things you can't do in there. I mean, you can cheat and steal and commit a hypocrisy, but I mean, there's a certain behavior in these buildings, right? It's interesting to ask yourself, you know, what is the religion of a land? You look around, you look at their temples, and you see, well, that's what it is. God's saying, don't create these sorts of images. Um, don't set up these idols. God is the God of Israel, and that's a truth to everyone um, uh, today as well. God is the God of the world, okay? So we need to... Uh, recognize him. But uh, verse 2 says, He shall keep my Sabbath and reverence my sanctuary. Now, he's already detailed what it means to keep the Sabbath and reverence the sanctuary. So, we're not going to get into the details of this. He's just reiterating the laws here. The point of Leviticus is that they're going to keep holy days, Sabbaths, and keep holy places, sanctuaries. It's interesting, he only mentions those two. I mean, there's other commandments that he gave, but he mentions the holy places and the holy days. And what are some of the few things that Christians continually try to keep in their religion today? Holy places and holy days. We're going to meet on Sunday. It's the Lord's Day. It's a holy day. And we're going to the church. It's a sacred place. This is the sanctuary, right? Why is this the sanctuary? When you go out of here, you're no longer sanctified. And if you're sanctified, it isn't where you're at the sanctuary. This is a legitimate question. Paul says, no, you're not. You're the temple of the Holy Spirit. If you're the temple of the Holy Spirit, where you're at in Christ is where you're in sanctuary, <laughs> right? Otherwise, yeah, you walk into these walls. This is a sacred place. Do you feel God in this room? Well, not according to the mystery, you don't, because uh, we have the temperature a little low. But, uh, Christ is in you if you're saved. The Holy Spirit dwells in you. Okay? It's not about a feeling, it's about a faith. But meanwhile, uh, back in Leviticus 26, there was a holy place and a holy day, and uh, God reminds them that I am the Lord God Jehovah. Verse 3, here's the blessings. If ye walk in my statutes and keep my commandments, then I will give you thus and so. Notice the structure of Leviticus 26. If something, then something. This is a conditional statement. If something happens, then a result will occur. Well, in this case, he's going to uh, four times in this passage talk about an if-then condition. The first one's here in verse 3 and 4, where if they walk and do, then four will say, here's the blessings. Right? Down in verse 18 is another place where it uses this if-then structure. If you will not, you see that in verse 18? If you will not, then what in verse 18? I will punish. Right? So if you do, in verse 3 and 4, then I will bless. If you do not, in verse 18, I will punish. This is very easy to understand. It's almost like a parent talking to their children. But that's exactly what God's doing to Israel, leading them through as children the rights and the wrongs. Okay? Then in verse 23 and 24, it gets even worse. It says, if you will not be reformed for me, by me by these things, but will walk contrary to me, then I will also walk contrary to you. 
Uh, you don't want that, folks. It's one thing if God's mad at you. It's a different thing if God's walking contrary to you. You'll run right smack into him. This is a problem. You don't want to be face to face with God. <laughs> uh, you want to be following him. That's how you want, right? Face to face with him, you're on the wrong side of the line, right? And so 23 and 24 says, if you won't walk uh, with me and walk contrary to me, then I will walk contrary to you. And then lastly, in verse 41 and 42, it says, um, I also have walked contrary to them. It says down at the hat, second half of the verse, if then their uncircumcised hearts be humbled and they then accept the punishment of their iniquity, then will I remember my covenant with Jacob, with Isaac and Abraham. So at the very end of the chapter, there's some hope here in the fact that if they humble themselves and accept the punishment, then I will remember the promises that I made to the fathers. So we have those four instances of if-then conditional statements. But you see how people would operate under the law. If-then conditions. How do you know what God's doing in your life? Well, am I obeying what he said to do? Right? That's how people think about it. If I'm, I've done, I did his instructions, then God will bless me. If I don't, God will curse me. Right? They're operating according to Leviticus. If that's how you think God operates with you today, you're operating under the law. And you're denying the finished work of Christ. Because the two are contrary to each other. Because okay, under the law, Christ had not yet come and died. Under the law, God had not yet revealed the dispensation of his grace. God is always gracious, but he had not revealed the operation, the dispensation of him being gracious to the whole world. Because here he's operating under the law. And so you have to evaluate that about yourself, that am I operating with God under this if-then conditional standing? If I do, God's happy with me. If I don't, he's not. That is not how grace works, folks. Grace works that because Christ did, then you are. You see, there's no if on you. It's the if it's true that Christ is God, and if it's true that Christ died on the cross for my sins, and if it's true Christ rose from the dead, which are all true, by the way, then you can be saved by God's grace, and you have a heavenly position, and you're sanctified in Christ, and you have all spiritual blessings. See, all these things follow by grace because of what Christ did. He did the work. See how the difference is there. So you also see how I'm using Leviticus to teach grace. It's not found in the chapter, but I'm using it to contrast. People say, well, how can you teach all scripture? This is a good way right here. Knowing the end from the beginning, I can tell you what they don't know in Leviticus 26. And yet you now know because I've read later in the Bible. Right? So you've got to keep that in the forefront of your mind. Also, if we read these blessings here. Let's go back to verse 3 and 4. If you walk in my statutes and keep my commandments and do them, look what the blessings are. I will give you rain. Now, it rains on your day, and you're like, we even use it as a saying, as a bad day, right? You're having a, a rainy day. But you got to understand, if you're a farmer, and it's the right time of the year, rain is good, right? And talk to someone in Arizona or in the desert. Rain is good, right? And so when God says, I will give rain in due season, I mean, you don't want rain in the wrong time. You don't want rain in the right time. And who controls the rain? Not you. <laughs> you see, so I mean, you're just hoping for rain, you know. And he says, if you obey my commandments, then I will give you, who's the you? Israel. Rain in due season, and the land shall yield her increase, and the trees of the field shall yield their fruit. Your threshing shall reach unto the vintage, which has to do with the amount of harvest they have. It'll be all year, right? And the vintage shall reach unto the sowing time. He shall eat your bread to the full and dwell in the land safely. Okay, notice something about the blessings is that they're, first of all, physical. And by that I mean natural. They're not spiritual. Rain is not spiritual. It's a physical thing, right? Fruit trees are physical things. They taste delicious, right? These are not spiritual fruits. These are physical fruits. You go to the grocery store, you get physical fruits. And God's saying, if you obey my commands, I will give you these physical things. People today think that God operates that way today with them, and they think, well, if I do good, God will bless me with physical things. Well, there's a place in the Bible where God said he would do that. Leviticus 26. Okay. Ephesians 1, 3 says he's blessed with all spiritual blessings. So be careful of requiring God to give you physical blessings because of your behavior or your position or your condition. God's offering spiritual blessings and spiritual fruit today. And so you have to look, look in that way. But here, it's all physical. Number two, notice that they concern the people and their land. Okay. Verse 6 says, I will give peace in the land and ye shall lie down, and none shall make you afraid. I will rid evil beasts out of the land, neither shall the sword go through the land. Ye shall chase your enemies, and they shall fall before you by the sword. 
Five of you shall chase an hundred. A hundred of you shall ch uh, put 10,000 to flight and your enemies shall fall before you by the sword. Right? These are concerning the people in their land, the kind of people they are, the power that they possess, and the land that they're in. Right? Um, so it requires a nation being in a specific place. All right? uh, also, lastly, notice that they affect God's provision for them and the power God provides to them. Okay? Um, God pro will provide for them food. He'll provide for them peace and safety. In fact, I've listed a few P words there just because that's what preachers do. They alliterate. It, the blessings I've listed there in verse 5 include provision. Verse 5 is plenty and prosperity. We'll have a lot of provision, right? In verse 6, there's peace. In verse uh, 6, also, there's protection from enemies. And in verse 7, there's even power over their enemies, where it's not just that they're protected, but they actually have conquering power, right? So they will rule, which was God's promise to Israel. They'd be a nation above the nations. Follow? Good. So down in verse uh, 10, uh, it says, or uh, verse 9, the reason why he'll do this, because when they obey the commands, I will have respect unto you and make you fruitful and multiply you and establish my covenant with you. There's a covenant people in a sacred place doing God's commands according to the law. Verse 10 says, you shall eat old store and bring forth the old because of the new. This has to do with your storage when they store things up for the times of famine, which is what wise people ought to do. Um, they'll say, you're going to eat the old. Why? Because you have so much coming in, you, just, you don't have a place to put it, so you're going to have to eat the old and get rid of that and put the new in, because you're always going to have plenty. So much. And it will be times of famine. You see? And so the old store will need to be used up. In verse 11, I will set my tabernacle amongst you. My soul shall not abhor you. I will walk among you and will be your God. You shall be my people. All conditioned on what? Their obedience to the law. If they obey the law, I will be your God. You will be my people. You will have peace, prosperity, provision, protection, power. Verse 13, I am the Lord your God, which brought you forth out of the land of Egypt, that you should not be their bondman. And I have broken the hands of your yoke and made you go upright. That's the best case scenario for Israel. Sounds good for Israel, right? That's a minor description of the kingdom on the earth when it gets set up in Israel, okay? Um, that's what would happen in Israel if they obeyed. And there were a few times where this kind of glimmer shone through in Israel's history. Right? But this was not the rule at all because of Israel's constant disobedience. But God did promise Israel provision. God never, by the way, promised America physical provision. I have to say that because there's people who believe manifest destiny still exists and that America is God's covenanted people. And you can't put America in Leviticus. We have no tribe of the Levites. Okay? You can't put America in Leviticus because we're not in the land Leviticus is talking about. Okay? It's talking about God's covenanted people here and how Israel would be a land above the other nations. Because not every nation can have power over other nations. It doesn't make sense. God chose one nation to be above the nations. He said, I promise you power when you obey my commandments over all the other nations. Right? And so, just be cognizant of that. All right? Uh, verse 14 then. Thus begins the section of punishments, which is twice as long as the blessings. All right? Uh, you think that would have been a hint right there. First, it dissuades them from disobeying the law. But secondly, God's thought about this a little bit. Um, we shouldn't test him in this regard. But of course, humanity is sinful, right? And so this is going to uh, articulate here a sad future for the nation. And we'll see even uh, some of the, the men of God in Israel's history warn Israel. They say, you remember what God said about those curses? Be careful. Don't let it happen in your generation. It's almost like as if they knew it was going to happen because man's sinful and God is righteous and he has to do what the covenant says. But essentially what their warning was, don't let it be today. Don't let it be today. It's going to happen to live you today. And you'll see in Israel's history over the course of centuries that one generation would be at peace. The next generation would face punishment. One generation would be at peace. No one would face punishment. Because of the appeal of the prophets and the people of God trying to persuade and sometimes there were successes and other times there were failures. But ultimately all of these curses, these punishments were fulfilled. And some of them, the very last part, is yet to be fulfilled. Meanwhile, let's get to it. In verse 14, notice the structure of these curses. If you will not hearken unto me, and will not do all these commandments. Now, just again to remind us, in order to be repetitive, can you do the law today? Can you do the law at all at any time? No. Okay, you cannot. 
Romans 3 teaches us there's none righteous, no, not one. This very book in Leviticus says that when you transgress the law, here's sacrifices you offer for your sins. So the law taught them they're going to sin, right? Because the law is perfect and holy and just, and people are not, right? And Romans teaches us, Romans 1, 2, and 3, that none of us are righteous. None of us can claim before God, yes, I've done enough, I've, I've done good. None of us are good, okay? And so we need God's grace. And Leviticus 26, it talks about when you don't. If you do not, this is what's going to happen. If you will not hearken unto me, then uh, these things will happen. What you'll see as you read these next 26 verses is that there are five times that this if shows up. There are five times where Leviticus 26, God says, if you, will hearken un if you will not hearken unto me, then I'll do this. Then it says, and if you will continue not to hearken to me, then I'll do this. And if even still you don't hearken unto me, I'll do this. He says, well, five times it does that. And so it's been taught, and it's from the scripture here, that there's five punishments here, which constitute five times in Israel's now future, or then future, now history, right? Where God will pour out these punishments. And these punishments are going to be an increasing degree. They start out minor punishments and get more and more severe, okay? So ultimately, Jesus came, and what did he say? There'll be a time of tribulation which the world has never known. This is included in God's promised covenant, where the most severe punishment is yet to be totally complete. Right? And so, um, we see the all end here. I don't have time to go through all the details in today's lesson. I hope just have some fun with this, summarizing it and giving it uh, to you so that you can do some further study on your own. Hopefully, it'll give you some framework to study the Old Testament a bit. But um, that's what's going on here. It's in other places in the law called curses. In Leviticus 26, it uses the word punishment exclusively. But in Deuteronomy, it uses the word curse, which maybe you're familiar with in other places. Uh, Paul says in Galatians 3.10 that if you're under the law, you're under a curse. And so when you talk about the Ten Commandments, or the law of tithing, or the law of clothing, or the law of holy places, all of those are laws. And if you put yourself under the power of laws, you're under a curse. Paul says that because he already taught there's none righteous. So there, there's no hope for you saying, well, I'm under the law to get the blessings. You're delusional, right? It may work for a bit. You're, you're a sinner. You're going to sin in this. You're going to have the curse. Anyone under the law is under a curse. Paul continues to say in Galatians 3 that Christ became a curse for us, right? That's the response to the law. Well, you're saying that it's okay to sin. I'm not saying this at all. I'm saying Christ was made a curse for me because the problem with the law is cursing on me. <laughs> this is what's going to happen. And so Christ became a curse for me to make me a new creature that I may be baptized into him that I may walk alive in him. Resurrection is a lot more powerful than curses to motivate me to action. God committing his love to die for me and his resurrection power in me is a lot more motivational to do good works that I should do than to put me under a required law trusting my flesh to do them. Won't happen, right? And so uh, we, we learn things further in the scripture, but here God is instituting his justice his command for righteousness, and is trying to teach his children, his nation here, what is going to happen when you, when you disobey me. There's going to be consequences. There's going to be a curse. There's going to be wrath. Okay? Every child needs to learn that lesson. There's consequences to your actions. There's right and there's wrong. There's going to be wrath. That's why there's parents. Okay? Hopefully there's a time where they learn this lesson so that when they grow up, you can start to say, now you can operate by grace. I'm not going to follow you around with a paddle. Right? That's how it works with people growing up, hopefully. Right? Uh, Leviticus 26 is at that time in Israel's history, dispensationally, where there are children here. And so as a nation, as a people, as a humanity, God's saying, time for the paddle, right? That's where we're at. So these aren't happy verses, but we'll get through them, and, and we'll see. Um, I put on your outline there what a curse was, just to remind us. Some people think of a curse in, in these days because of a lot of the lies and myths out there that a curse is like a witch's hex. I think it's been going around lately, some witch is trying to hex people and this sort of thing. That's, that's not the way the Bible talks about curses. Witchcraft is idolatry. Okay? It's, not, it's magical, it's mystical, it's fake, it's a lie. It has nothing to do with the scripture or true spirituality at all. Or even the spiritual world. Okay? Um, a curse is a condemnation. That's what it is. And so a condemnation is what happens when you break God's covenant. Right? And that's why it's a curse. And so a curse is not something that, uh, uh, is, is something that, that stains you now. Right? It's a condemnation because of their, your actions under the law. A curse is only as strong as the one who utters it. Right? I can try to curse you or speak curses at you, and who am I to utter condemnation to you? That's a question you ought to ask when people curse you out. You know, a lot of people curse because they have no other language to say, and they try to curse at you as if the words that they're saying are somehow going to condemn you. And you think about that, it's, it's kind of funny. 
I mean, I'm going to curse, curse, curse at you, and this is supposed to condemn you. So they're assuming that the words of their mouth are somehow have authority over you. Isn't that kind of a funny thing? But whose words do have authority over you? Well, uh, the sheriff, <laughs> uh, uh, the judge in your county, right? Uh, God, you know. But the utterances of curses and condemnations are only as strong as the authority the person has who utters them. So, you know, sticks and stones, right, folks? <laughs> uh, if people don't have any authority over you, which is why the power of God's grace is so powerful, because Paul says in Romans 6, you're not under the power of any. You're not under the power of death or of the law or of sin. So if the law utters a condemnation, you're not under that condemnation. It has no authority over you. And you're not under death. So if death says, well, you're going to die someday, you're going to get sick and die, it has no power over you. You have a resurrection, right? So that's how, how beautiful and powerful God's grace is. You're not under that authority. There's no condemnation to be uttered unto you in Christ because you have... There's no authority over you except for Jesus Christ, your head. Right? So, amen to that. Luke 26, then, is these utterance of curses. Because the law for Israel, a covenant, is an authority over you, especially if it's God's covenant. So, you're placing yourself under this authority, and Israel was underneath it. Okay? Let's look at verse 14 through 17 here. The first punishment that God utters. If you will not hearken, uh, see the word hear there? That's what that means. Hear, if you don't hear me, right? If you will not hearken, not listen to me. Uh, and will not do all these commandments. And if you shall despise my statutes, or if your soul abhors my judgments, so that you will not do all my commandments, which teaches what? James 2 and 9 and 10, right? If you don't do all the law, what's it say? You're guilty of all. James 2, 9 and 10, faith without works, is James teaching Leviticus. That's what he's doing. Okay. He's writing to the 12 tribes of Israel in James 1, 1, teaching the law in James 2. That's why he quotes the law in James 2, the perfect law of liberty, and quotes Leviticus. He says, if you don't do it, it don't do just one, you're guilty of all. It's therefore, do all is what James says. That's what Leviticus 26 says. You've got to do all. If you don't do all my commandments, but that you break my covenant, I will also do this unto you. Now, God said this before they broke his covenant, remember. That's a mercy, folks. God is merciful, and God... It tells you what he's going to do. Nowhere in the scripture we find in Israel's Old Testament where God punishes, where God kills as a result of judgment, where God condemns without him first sending a message to people that that's what he's doing. And gives them warning. Not just telling them that's what I'm doing, but gives them warning to get out. In fact, God always provides salvation. And see, it's to men's condemnation that we don't receive it. We put it off. It'll happen later. God's not going to do anything. He hasn't done anything yet. You know, why is he going to do anything in the future? So they put it off the judgment and we don't repent. We don't listen to what God says. And that's exactly why God does those things. He says he's going to do them and he's faithful to do what he said. Unlike oftentimes parents get accused of, of, of threatening their children and never following through, right? Children learn that pretty quick. And they learn that because they never follow through. This is not God. God says and he warns and he gives mercy and salvation and then he follows through. Right? And there's punishment. And so to, to men's despair, that's what will happen. But these are the things that he does in verse uh, are we at 16. These are the things I will do unto you. I'll even appoint over you terror. God will appoint terror, consumption, and the burning agoo. Have you ever had the burning agoo? You even know what this is? Now, you're all going to be like, I don't know. I had dinner last night. That was kind of strange. <laughs> burning agoo. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a fever, folks. This is fever, okay? This is a sickness. And so the burning agoo, you ever had a fever? You know, you're hot, that's, that's fever. Anyway, that's what that is. Uh, the terror consumption of the burning agoo that shall consume the eyes and cause sorrow of heart and you shall sow your seed in vain for your enemies shall eat it. I will set my face against you and you shall be slain before your enemies. They that hate you shall reign over you and you shall flee when none pursues you. That's pretty bad. That's the first level, huh? Yeah, that's the first punishment. Okay. Um, this actually occurs in Israel's history over the course of some 400 years. This is not the case where the first time someone picks up uh, sticks, oh, actually, that guy did die. But <laughs> that's the only time you read about someone dying, picking up sticks on a Sunday. Do you know that part in Numbers? You know what I'm talking about? The guy picked up sticks on Sunday right after God told him not to, and he, they killed him. That, that was an example, by the way. You don't read a second case of that. But it was the law not to labor on the Sunday. And you see after years and decades and centuries of people breaking the Sabbath, that then God says, we've been breaking the Sabbath too long. It's time for punishment. People say, well, God's so wrathful and vengeful back there. He's such a quick wick. He'll just right off the cuff just punish people. No, he doesn't. He says, I will punish you if you break the law. And he waits 400 years, sending people to tell them, you better do the law, repent, repent, repent. And then after 450 years, I said I was going to do this. I'm going to do it. 
That is called long suffering. God is long suffering to Israel. Romans 2, Paul says, didn't you who read the law know the law? Didn't you read about God's long suffering? And they didn't. Because they were so wicked. All they saw was God's vengeance. Oh, God is so hateful. No, he's not hateful and he's not vengeful in that way. Okay. It breaks God's heart to have to punish his creation, thus being the nation of Israel under the covenant. Okay. Because he wanted for them, he promised to them glory. God is not glory over the death of the wicked. That's what Psalm says, right? He's a God of salvation, but God is also a faithful and just God. And he'll, he will judge all humanity. Leviticus 26, then, uh, what he's doing here, is he says, I will set my face against them. And uh, in summary, this punishment is that God will have them be consumed by others. Their flesh will be consumed by disease, right? Flu, disease, sickness, right? It says consumption there. The word itself is there, consumption. So what they have, okay, they have a land and blessings and fruits and all sort of stuff. They'll have it, but it will be consumed, right, by other people. So it's kind of like when you work until April and then the government takes you know, your paycheck away, you know? Uh, that's like consumption, right? You didn't consume it. Someone else did. And isn't this like, ah, cursed, you know, you know, uh, that's, that's kind of what this is. It says your enemies shall consume what you sow. Cause you'll sow in vain. Why is it in vain? Cause your enemies shall eat it. It's not that nothing comes out of the ground and it comes out of the ground and then someone else eats it. You're going is, is it taxation. <laughs> this is uh, the taking of things, consumption by the people. So this is the first uh, punishment. You see this happen. Um, in jo Joshua and Judges. Look at Joshua chapter 24. Let's show you some, let's go to the future here. Leviticus was the law given at Mount Sinai. They, some 40 years after, they, uh, they actually went into the land. Joshua is the account of their going into the land. Joshua 23, verse 16. In verse 15, look what it says here, Joshua 23, 14, uh, 15 and 16. Therefore it shall come to pass that as all good things are come upon you, which the Lord your God promised you, so shall the Lord bring upon you all evil things until he have destroyed you from off this good land from which the Lord your God hath given you. Well, this is such a party pooper because they just got into this good land. This is going, it's going to happen or you guys are going to leave. How does he know this? It's Leviticus 26 says. Right? That's how he knows. Verse 16, when you have transgressed the covenant of the Lord your God, which he commanded you and have gone and served other gods and bowed yourselves to them, then shall the anger of the Lord be kindled against you. You see that phrase? The anger of the Lord be kindled against you. You shall perish quickly from off the good land which he hath given unto you. Verse chapter 24, Joshua gathers all the tribes of Israel together. And remember the appeal of Joshua in chapter 24, he gathers them together and says, guys, um, don't commit idolatry because God will punish you. That's what he said in the law. Now that we're in the land, we're going to try to keep this law. Please don't. The popular passage of Joshua 24 is, is what? When he says, for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, right? Because he wants protection for his house. How do you get protection from God under this covenant? <laughs> you, do, you do the law. You obey the Lord. But down in verse uh, 19 and 22, uh, chapter 24, Joshua said unto the people, you cannot serve the Lord. He is a holy God. He's a jealous God. People say, well, I'll obey the law, I'll serve the God in every way, and he'll be pleased with me. Joshua says, you can't. Stop saying that. <laughs> you can't. He says, he's a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions nor your sins. His, his point there is that sins have to be paid for. Right? That's what he's saying. Joshua knows, knows nothing about Christ. But he says, your sins won't be forgotten. They have to be paid for by someone. Right? And so plead for God's mercy is the consequence. In verse uh, 20, if you forsake the Lord and serve strange gods, then he will turn and do you hurt and consume you. Where did he get that idea? Because 26, the first course of punishment was that I will consume you with your enemies, right? It hasn't happened yet in Joshua 23 and 24. They're in the land. It hasn't happened yet. But he's warning them, don't serve other gods because the first thing that's going to happen is he's going to consume you. You don't want that. He's a consuming fire. That's bad. You know? And so he says in verse 20, he will consume you after that you have done after he hath done you good. Just because he's done you good now doesn't mean he's going to do, do you good later, right? Isn't that the idea? That's what he's saying. That's also different than grace, by the way, right? Grace, God looks at people who are bad and justifies them by faith in Christ's finished work, right? So it's, it's, it's a different scenario here, different circumstance, different relationship with God. 
So verse 21, the people said unto Joshua, Nay, but we will serve the Lord. And Joshua said unto the, the people, You are witnesses against yourselves, that ye have chosen you, the Lord, to serve him. And they said, We are witnesses. And then he says, Therefore put away the strange gods, and don't incline your heart to evil. Right? And so you see there Joshua's warning. The next book is Judges. Have you ever read Judges? You know what happens in Judges? Remember in Joshua 23 and 24 where he says that if you serve other gods, the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you. And in Leviticus 26, the covenant curse was that if you don't do my commandments, then I will set my face against you. What does this mean? Set my face against you. That's what this means. That's what that means, right? He's not going to be smiling. His face at you is not going to be good. This is anger face, right? Um, that's what that means literally. Because later in the chapter, you'll see it gets worse. Just having someone's face against you, what are you doing? is different than having someone turn at you and run at you. This is different. And that's what God says he's going to do later. The fifth course of punishment, God says, I will walk contrary to you in fury. This is like linebacker. You don't want this, right? Walk contrary to you in fury. Don't want it. But his face against you, that's also bad. But judges, all throughout the book, the judges goes like this. Let, let's read uh, chapter 2, verse 1 through 3. In judges, they're in the land, right? Joshua brought them to the land. Remember Jericho and all that business? He brought them into the land. And, and then they're supposed to conquer the people in the land, like, you know, kick them out. And this is our land. God gave it to us. And they, they leave, right? But they didn't. Judges 1, if you read it, it says, and this tribe went there and they left the people there. This tribe went over here and left the people there. And the tribe went over here and left the people there. And they didn't tell them to leave. There's like, oh, guys, it's all right. You live over here. I live over here. So they're sharing the land now with people God told them to kick out, Right? So Judges 2, the angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bochum and said, I made you to go out of Egypt and brought you into the land, which I swear unto your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. And verse 2, you shall make no league with the inhabitants of the land. You shall throw down their altars, but you have not obeyed my voice. Why have you done this? This is God appealing to them, right? What have you done? I told you very clearly. This is like parents' children, right? I told you to throw that away. What have you done? Not what I told you. <laughs> you know. And so this is what the angel of the Lord's saying. In verse 3, then he says, Wherefore, I also said, I will not drive them out before you, but they shall be as thorns in your sides, and their God shall be a snare to you. You see what he said? I told you to obey me, and I would be your God. You didn't obey me. Why did you do this? Therefore, these people that you left in the land are going to consume your fruit. You see what happened there? God's punishment is now going to be fulfilled. And it was fulfilled in part by their own disobedience. Their disobedience was leaving people in the land. Isn't that amazing? They were probably, no doubt, trying to strike a, strike a treaty in the, in the name of peace. We don't want to you know, kick you out of your home. You've been here for a while. We'll just let you stay here. And God says, that's wrong. I told you not to do that. I told you to just split from these people. But because they're here, they're going to consume you, just like I said would happen as my punishment to you. Right? God will not do it for them to kick them out. He's going to leave them there. And this will plague Israel for their history all the way through Jesus. Because Jesus comes and they're ruled by the Romans who are consuming them. Right? And remember that coin in the fish's mouth? Why'd that have to happen? They've got to pay taxes. To who? The Romans. Right? So th this, this punishment continues until the kingdom. And each punishment kind of is layered on top of the old one. And we'll kind of see how that works. But you see this beginning to happen. Now look at uh, Leviticus 26, verse 18. Let's move on with these curses. So you see these verses here in 14 through 17, that communicates what God is doing through Joshua and Judges. The whole book of Judges, it says, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. The anger of the Lord was kindled. That, that is the first punishment. 400 years there, what God does. We're down in verse 18. You see the phrase, if you will not yet for all this hearken unto me. So after all this that I'm going to do in these three verses, which is 400 years in Judges, if you will not do this, then this is what's going to happen. For all this, then I will punish you seven times more, thus the increase in punishment, right? Seven times more for your sins, and I will break the pride of your power, and I will make your heaven as iron, and your earth as brass. Now we're already at Judges. After Judges, you have Samuel, and in Samuel, uh, wicked Israel, because of their time in the Judges, ask for a king, remember? And they want a king, and, God, and, and uh, Samuel's there saying, you guys don't want a king, God is your king. That was the law. You have no king because you're unique. God is your king. You don't need one. But they said they wanted to be like the Gentiles. And uh, God actually appeases them in this way and says, Samuel, I'll give them what they want. Because God knows, first of all, he's long-suffering and merciful. So this is a time where he's showing an instance of grace. But secondly, he needs to give a covenant to a king of Israel. Remember? And so he sets up a king. 
Saul, David, Solomon, he's going to set this king here. So he does this in Samuel, in first, second Samuel. But in, in Leviticus 26, the curse after they continue to disobey God, which they're not looking promising at this, this point in their history. He says, I'll punish you seven times more. Break the pride of your power. Make your heaven as iron and your earth as brass. What happens as a result of having kings over Israel? After a short period of glory during Solomon's reign, David had a hard time of it, fighting and trying to obtain power. Solomon, his son, however, because of God's promise to David that your son would be a king on the throne, because of God's grace to David, Solomon's son actually had a time of prosperity, more so than Jeff Bezos and Bill Gates. He was a multi-trillionaire, okay, in, in modern currency standards, uh, in not only currency, but in wisdom and in possessions too, okay? And so Solomon uh, was the wisest man because of God's blessing on him, right? But Solomon, this wisest man, also became what? Uh, a wicked king, if you didn't know that. Uh, Solomon, they, they say, is one of the greatest kings in his history, which is true. Uh, but he also, the second half of his life, rejected God, okay? And so we see in Lucas 26, the punishment was, I will break the pride of your power. In their pride, Israel wanted a king. God gave them a king. The king became powerful. All the nations of the world understood the wisdom of Solomon. And then he says, I'll break the pride of your power. And what happens with Solomon in 1 Kings 11? Look at 1 Kings 11. As we're moving through Israel's history. 1 Kings 11, verse 6. Solomon marries a few women. A few. Yeah. In verse 6, uh, Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord. And went not fully after the Lord, as did David his father. You see, that's the legacy of Solomon, unfortunately. Then did Solomon build high places for Chemosh, uh, the abomination of Moab, in the hill that is before Jerusalem, and for Molech, the abomination of the children of Ammon. And likewise did he for all his strange wives, which burnt incense and sacrificed unto their gods. And the Lord was angry with Solomon, because his heart was turned from the Lord God of Israel, which had appeared unto him twice. And had commanded him, you see, God appeared to him before he puts his punishment down. And he had commanded him concerning this thing that he should not go after other gods, but he kept not that which the Lord commanded him. Wherefore, the Lord said unto Solomon, for as much as this is done of thee, and thou hast not kept my covenant and my statutes. Do you hear the legalese here? Because you have not kept the written record of our covenant, I will surely rend the kingdom from thee and will give it to thy servant. Notwithstanding in thy days, I will not do it. For David's sake, I will rend it out of the hand of thy son. Okay. So what happens after Solomon's reign? The nation splits. It splits. Leviticus 26 says, I will break the pride of your power. No longer. In Israel's history, the most glorious time in their history up to today has been Solomon's reign. Okay. And God broke that because of Solomon's disobedience and the nations. And Solomon being the ruler said, this is it. I've warned you for years I break in the pride of your power. And ever since then, Israel's been a broken, split nation, divided between two houses, Israel and Judah, which is why through prophecies after that time, you'll read to the house of Israel and the house of Judah, because they're split. It's like if that would have happened in America, and God had a covenant with America, which he doesn't, who had wrote into the northern states and the southern states. You know, it's kind of that sort of thing. So Israel was the northern tribes, and, and uh, Judah was the southern tribes, okay? So he breaks the pride of their power here. In 1 Kings 17, the other part of the curse was that their heaven would be as iron and their earth as brass. What does this mean? What comes from heaven? Rain, right? And if it's as iron, you get water out of iron much? No. And if your earth is brass, how do you like tilling that? I like planting seeds in brass. Doesn't happen. Well, in 1 Kings 17, the prophet during this time in Israel's history was Elijah. And what did Elijah do in chapter 17 and verse 1? Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. There was a drought. God said, I will not let it rain. And Elijah, God's man, comes and says, It's not going to rain. Why didn't this happen in Joshua or Judges? Because that wasn't God's dictated punishment. But during this time, after the first punishment, the second punishment is, I'm going to divide your power, break your power, and I'm going to not make it rain. This is what happens, you see. So, I mean, this has been a lot of years, a lot of reading in your Bible. If you don't know Leviticus 26, you're thinking this is just random things. God's just saying, oh, I won't make it rain for a while. I'll just, you know, do this. He's not. 
He told them what was going to happen, and he does exactly what he said. Okay? Very interesting here just to see Israel's history prophesied. All right? Let's look, go back to Leviticus 26. Let's read about Israel's history again. Leviticus 26 and verse 21. And if you will walk... Uh, do we read verse 20? We didn't. Your strength shall be spent in vain, for your land shall not yield her increase, neither shall the trees of the land yield their fruits. What's interesting about this, remember the first punishment? It, it, he said that you'll, you'll bear fruits, but your enemies will take them. Right? This one, it's that you won't even bear fruits. The land, the, the, no rain, no the brass on the earth, so you won't even have the fruit for people to consume. This is a problem. Um, in verse 21, if you will walk contrary unto me and will not hearken unto me, I will bring seven times more plagues upon you according to your sins. This is the third punishment. I will send wild beasts among you, which shall rob you of your children, destroy your cattle, and make you few in number, and your highway shall be desolate. That doesn't sound good. You see how they're progressively getting worse? At first he says, you'll make fruit, but your enemies will take them from you. Right? Then he says, you won't even make any fruit. And then he's like, your population's going to go down. Now, now you're really getting touchy and personal because people are dying. Right? Well, yeah, this is the third punishment. Well, they're not dying because of some enemy warfare. They're dying, apparently, of natural tragedies right he says wild beasts no why doesn't god protect them from the wild beasts he broke the covenant didn't know what he said in the blessings he protected from wild beasts right when was the last time you feared a dinosaur or a lion or a bear you know not in a while god must be blessing america <laughs> you know? but that's the type of thing right there are some places in the world where they fear a wild beast eating them part of the blessings of israel is if they obeyed the commandments god would prohibit that from happening so as God removes some more of his protection and provision, we see Israel now being succumbed to the natural things that the world succumbs to, you know, at the time, including wild beasts. So as we proceed in Israel's history, after Elijah leaves, Elijah is the one that caused the drought, right? After he goes to heaven, and that's not a euphemism, that's literal. He didn't, he's with heaven now, just like grandpa. No, he actually went up in a whirlwind, right? I mean, he, he ascended up there. But in uh, 2 Kings... I'm sorry, 1 Kings uh, chapter 21. You see this third punishment uh, start to happen. 1 Kings 21 in verse 25. Where God again kind of declares this curse on Ahab. You know Ahab, one of those wicked kings in Israel? In those history? In verse 25, it says, There was none like unto Ahab, which did sell himself to work wickedness in sight of the Lord, with whom Jezebel, his wife, stood up. And he did very abominably in following idols, according to all things, as did the Amorites, whom the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. And it came to pass, when Ahab heard those words, that he rent his clothes and put sackcloth uh, uh, upon his, his flesh, and fasted and lay in sackcloth and went softly. And Elijah came and said, Seest thou how Ahab humbles himself before me? Ahab humbled himself before God? That's kind of a shocker. Right? But he did. And what's God's covenant if you humble yourself before me? Well, we haven't got there yet. But the covenant said, if you humble yourself before me, then I'll remember. But he says, because he humbles himself before me, I will not bring the evil in his days, but in his son's days will I bring the evil upon his house. So Ahab's son Ahaziah is when the, the, the third punishment occurs. And we see that occur in chapter 22 and verse 51. 1 Kings 22, 51. This is the very end of 1 Kings, right? Ahaziah, the son of Ahab, began to reign over Israel. Verse 52, he did evil in the sight of the Lord and walked in the way of his father and in the way of his mother and in the way of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. That's not good. For he served Baal and worshipped him and provoked to anger the Lord God of Israel according unto all that his father had done. You see again, provoking the Lord to anger, right? You say, well, how is this a sign of the third punishment? Look at 2 Kings chapter 2. Turn the page a couple. 2 Kings chapter 2. Since the second punishment's done, Elijah leaves. The prophet of the third punishment was Elisha. Elisha had the same message. Repent. Please obey the covenant. Don't let this happen. Right? And what's he do? 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 23. He went up from thence unto Bethel, and as he was going up by the way, there came forth little children out of the city and mocked him and said, Go up, thou bald head. Go up, thou bald head. Be careful. There's you know, the preaching. <laughs> Don't talk about people's hair or lack thereof. Verse 24, he turned back and looked on them and cursed them in the name of the Lord. Wow. I mean, talk about abuse of power, really. Elisha just gets his mantle from Elijah. And he's like, there's some kids. You know, 
Really? Why is he doing this? He says, there came forth two she bears out of the wood and tear 40 and two children. Wow. And he went from this to Mount Carmel, from this to return to Samaria. So that, and that's the brief story there. Elisha's returning back to the land. He goes to Bethel after preaching some of the word here. And there's a children mocking him. And bears come out of the wilderness and eat 42 of them. And you're reading that going, God is so, oh, wow, wicked and bloodthirsty. Well, didn't you read Leviticus 26? As he said, if you do my commandments, I'll protect you from the wild beast. If you don't, wild beast will eat your children. And that's the third punishment. He's already punished them twice, right? If you know Leviticus 26, you see God's long suffering. If all you're doing is reading 2 Kings 2, you're going, oh, God is, wow, he seems kind of wicked. But he's not when you see the course of Israel's history and what God has said and what God has done. God's the faithful one. Israel is not, right? This is an increasing degree of punishment. It's this third degree of punishment where I first had people consume your fruit, then I took away your fruit, and now the fruit of your flesh I'm taking away, right? I'm trying to get you to repent, right? Because you know what God could do, which he is justified in doing to sinners, is take them off the planet, right? Take them off entirely. And anyway, by the way, these children weren't obedient children in the first place. You get that, right? You say, well, they're still children. They're disobedient children. Okay, there's a difference, children, between obedient children and disobedient children. You can't claim childhood and say that protects me from everything. It doesn't, right? If you've been forewarned, <laughs> you know, you need to obey. Anyway, don't want to get too personal here. Let's, let's move on. Look at this 26, um, down in verse 23. We're in the fourth punishment now, right? So remember, see how many years are passing by here. Look at this 26, you just read right through these, but there's centuries here. And we see these events being fulfilled. Look at this 26, verse 23. <clears throat> now it gets, it gets worse. If you will not be reformed by me, by these things, but will walk contrary to me, still, right? Then will I also walk contrary to you. That's the first time God says that in the punishments. Before it was, Ava, my face set against you, I'll be angry, right? And, uh, you know, and then I'll be more angry. And then, you know, I'll, I'll even start to affect your families and your children. Please repent, right? And then he says, but now you continue to walk contrary to me, I will walk contrary to you, right? That's going to be bad. And I will punish you yet seven times for your sins. This is seven upon seven upon seven. That's interesting. Why did Jesus say about forgiveness? Anyway. In verse 25, I will bring a sword upon you and shall avenge the quarrel of my covenant. What's the quarrel of his covenant? We agreed. You're not keeping your side of it. Where's the avenger? Where's the collector, right? Well, God's held off now for three punishments, but now it's time for the avenger, right? And it's not Iron Man. This is going to be their enemies. And um, he says that the avenger of the covenant will come when he gathers together within your city, when you gather together in your cities, because people go to cities to be protected, it's not safe out in the wilderness now with the wild beasts out there. I will send the pestilence among you. You shall be delivered into the hand of your enemy. So now it's not just the enemy taxing you. Now you're going to be delivered to their hand. They're going to take you away. Right? And it says, when I have broken the staff of your bread, the uh, ten women shall bake your bread in one oven. And I know you all don't like that. Right? We all got to share one oven? Yes, one oven. Ten women. That's how you start a fight. And, and they shall deliver you your bread again by weight, and you shall eat and not be satisfied. So it's not just the oven thing. It's the fact that you won't have food to eat anymore. It's not just that your, your land won't bear fruit. And it's not just that your families are affected by it. You, now you're going to go hungry. You're going to be dissatisfied. Right? You won't have enough. You'll be lacking. So we're going in reverse here uh, from God's plentiful provision down to, yeah, I can pay my taxes, to not getting a good crop this year, to we're running low, like really low, like, we won't have dinner tonight. Right? See how it's getting worse, right? And so he says um, in this fourth punishment, he's going to walk contrary. Now look at Amos chapter 4. Amos 4. You see how we're progressively going to the right side of our Bible? <laughs> we keep going through this little history hill. Amos chapter 4. Amos was a prophet during the four fourth punishment. The fourth punishment will conclude with the enemies coming into the land and taking people out. Who do they take out? If you recall our lesson last week that we studied in the Song of Moses, there are two times that people get taken out of the land, or at least generally speaking, that the, the nation was split, remember? And there's the house of Israel, the house of Judah, and the house of Israel takes, is get taken by their enemies first, and then later in Israel's history, the house of Judah is taken out, right? The fourth punishment is the Assyrians come into Israel and destroy the house of Israel and take them captive into the land. Jerusalem still exists, Judah still exists, but the northern tribes are taken away. 
Okay? And so Amos was a prophet during this time. In Amos 4, listen to what God says. Before he does this, he sends a prophet to warn them. I also have given you cleanness of teeth in all your cities and want of bread in all your places, yet have you not returned unto me. Cleanness of teeth here is not crest. Cleanness of teeth is you don't have any food in your mouth. That's what that means. And he says, yet have you not returned unto me, saith the Lord. Also, I have withholden the rain from you when there were yet three months to the harvest, and I caused it to rain upon one city and not to rain on another city. One piece was rained upon, the other piece whereupon it rained, not with erd. So, see, you ever wonder, like, why is it rain over there and not over here? Well, it's not God. But at one time it was. <laughs> okay. And he says, I did that to you. And verse eight, so two or three cities wandered into one city to drink water, but they were not satisfied. You've heard that somewhere in the curse. Yet have you not returned unto me? You say that twice now. God in Amos here is going through his punishment. He says, I punished you the first time. You didn't return unto me. I punished you the second time. You didn't return unto me. I punished you the third time. You didn't return unto me. Okay. This is what he's saying in Amos six. And he goes through these things. I have smitten you with blasting and mildew when your gardens and your vineyards and your fig trees and your olive trees increased, the palmer worm devoured them. Yet have you not returned unto me. I have sent among you the pestilence after the manner of Egypt. Your young men have I slain with the sword that's in war and battle and have taken away your horses and I have made the stink of your camps come up into your nose nostrils. Yet have you not returned unto me. Now typically, even in this dispensation where people are ignorant of God's grace, in times of suffering, more people will turn to God. This is just a fact. Humanity is wicked, but when humanity is confronted with their own frailty, they turn to God. There's no atheist in foxholes, right? That's what they say. Every time there's a recession in our country, every time there's a downturn in the stock market, people start to pray. Why? <laughs> I don't know what's going on. I can't help anything. I need God's help, right? Now, that doesn't mean God's going to answer the prayer, and it doesn't mean God operates that way today. But there was a time when God did with his people where they could pray to him and humble themselves and say, God, we're sorry, we sin, we repent, please be our God again. Right? But Amos is saying, you didn't. I punished you and you didn't. I punished you and you didn't. I punished you and you didn't. And in verse 11, I have overthrown some of you as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah, and you were as a firebrand plucked out of the burning, yet have you not returned unto me. Therefore, this is the pronouncement of the fourth punishment, thus will I do unto thee, O Israel, because I will do this unto thee, prepare to meet your God. That's scary. Prepare to meet your maker. Why? Because I've told you four times and you've not turned unto me. God is long suffering, but his judgment doesn't last, his, his putting off of judgment doesn't last forever. He's a just holy God, you see. And so Amos 6 warns of this. And you see in 2 Kings 10, 31 and 32, this judgment occurs. 2 Kings 10 is at the end of Israel's history as far as the house of Israel. And you start to see them being taken captive and the enemies come into the land and take them away. Okay? So that's the fourth course. Let's, let's go on to the fifth course here just for the sake of time. Leviticus 26, down in verse 27. It gets even worse in, in this fifth course, which is the final curse of punishment. Because, uh, Leviticus 26, 27. If you will not for all this hearken unto me, but walk contrary to me, then I will walk contrary unto you also in fury. There's the walk contrary and fury. And I, even I, will chastise you seven times for your sins. Seven upon seven upon seven upon seven. And you shall eat the flesh of your sons and the flesh of your daughters shall you eat. Now that's just horrible. God's not making them do this, by the way. Okay? Not only have they rep reaped what they sowed, and God is offering them blessing if they'd only humble themselves and confess their sins, and they don't. Right? But it's because they have such lack of food. That's why they're doing this. God didn't tell them to do this. They don't say, oh, look how wicked God is. Look what he does to the children. No, God didn't do that. People did that, okay, because they didn't have food. And God is offering them food if they will just confess their sins, right? They have a covenant. They can get it. You see, so it's man's wickedness that causes the sins and the violence and the horrible nature of this world. It's not God. It's never God, okay? God always offers salvation. He always offers provision, and men never take it. They don't want God. They want the provision <clears throat> without God. They want to have all the good things without God. And the truth is, you can't have good without God. That's what God's communicating with the law and with grace and everything. Good only comes from God. And men reject that. Okay? What's God going to teach them? You can have good without me? That's where Adam failed. Right? That's where the world failed with Noah. That man constantly fails in that area. And today as well, when people think that we can succeed without Christ, we fail. 
right? In this dispensation, it's made most clear that the only way you can be saved is through God's finished work in Christ, right? Because 26, look at this curse here. You eat the flesh of your sons, the flesh of your daughters you shall eat, and I will destroy your high places. So the I is in verse 30, not in verse 20, 29. I will destroy your high places, cut down your images, cast your carcasses upon the carcasses of your idols, and my soul shall abhor you. You want to die with your idols? You'll die with them. And I will make your cities waste, bring your sanctuaries into desolation. I will not smell the Savior of sweet odors. So he's not going to heed their sacrifices or their law keeping anymore. They want to say, I want to do what I want and still offer sacrifices. God says, I don't want your sacrifices. Right? He's pretty angry. Okay? He's going to destroy their cities, which is far worse than just being taxed or not having a good year of crops. Now their cities are going to be destroyed. I will bring the land to desolation. Your enemies which dwell therein shall be astonished. Their enemies are going to take over their land and live in it. I will scatter you among the heathen and will draw out a sword after you. The land shall be desolate and your cities waste. Then shall the land enjoy her Sabbaths. Finally, the land will have a rest from you wicked people, right? So essentially, they end up kind of back where they started, scattered out from the land. And this happens in that fifth course we can read about in Jeremiah 11, verse 1 through 11. Look at Jeremiah 11. Jeremiah 11. <clears throat> Israel's already gone. Jeremiah 11 writes the word of the Lord to Jerusalem in verse 2. Hear ye the words of this covenant and speak unto the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Israel's already gone. Fourth punishment took care of them. And, and verse 3, Say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Cursed be the man that obeys not the words of this covenant. You see, it's the same message over and over again. Remember the covenant? I gave you the curses. Cursed be the man that doesn't do them. There's a declaration here. Jeremiah is declaring to, to Jerusalem, saying, look, guys, he's going to do it. You need to put it off. You need to obey. Same message, right? He says, this covenant which I commanded your fathers in the day I brought them forth out of the land of Egypt. That's Leviticus. Obey my voice is what he says. And you'll be my people. And I will be your God. But they won't. And in verse 5, the reason why he says to obey is that I may perform the oath which I promised to Abram, Isaac, and Jacob to give you a land flowing with milk and honey. And then down in verse 11, in verse 8, he says, they obeyed not, they didn't incline their ear. Verse 11, therefore, thus saith the Lord, behold, I will bring evil upon them, which they shall not be able to escape. And though they shall cry unto me, I will not hearken unto them. Okay. You ever read the prophets and think that sin is kind of harsh? The reason why is because you've skipped over the fourth punishments. You're reading the fifth one, right? You go, that's pretty harsh. Well, go back and read the history. And look at the first time that God punished him because they disobeyed him for 400 years. And the second time God punished him because they disobeyed him for 400 years. And the third time, he warns them over and over again. And he told them what he was going to do. And even the prophets are telling him what he's going to do. And they continue to reject him. They put Jeremiah in prison. They didn't say, thank you, Jeremiah, we repent. They put him in prison. Right? God warns them. They reject him continually. And then punishment happens. Okay? This is constantly the pattern. And this punishment that he says, that this, this extreme punishment is exactly what the fifth punishment details. Lamentations 2. Look at Lamentations. Turn to the right. It's between Ezekiel and Jeremiah. Lamentations 2.17. Jeremiah, after Jerusalem was destroyed by the Babylonians, Daniel was taken captive to another city along with uh, Hananiah and Mishaiah and all that. Lamentations 2.17. The Lord hath done that which he hath devised, he looks at the city and said, he's done that which he said he would do. He hath fulfilled his word they had commanded in the days of old. He hath thrown down and hath not pitied. He hath caused thine enemy to rejoice over thee. He hath set up the horn of thine adversaries. See what Jeremiah says after it's over? He goes, God did it. And so what does Jeremiah sing in Lamentations, weeping over the city? Because it's a horrible situation. What, we sing it in our hymns. Great is thy faithfulness. It's in Lamentations. Lamentations 3. Why does he say that? Because looking at all this rubble, he's going, the only good thing I see from all this is that God will do what he says. Because God said he would do it, and he's going to do it. And that gives hope for Jeremiah, because what did God say before the law? He promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, I will bless you. There's no condition to that one. So to Jeremiah and the faithful remnant, they could say, this is horrible. But God is faithful. He did what he said he was going to do. And he will do what he said he will do, which was to give a, a promised blessing to the nation, right? To the future hope. 
And so we can learn about God's faithfulness in the Old Testament so that today when he says, I'll give you salvation by grace through faith, not of works, you don't have to say, well, maybe I should do something just to cover my bases. You can trust God because he's faithful. Because the whole Old Testament teaches, if anything, God is long-suffering and God is faithful. And so Paul says, don't you know from your scriptures that God is gracious and God is faithful. And so when I preach to you that Christ did it all and you can trust everything that he did, you should know that he's gracious and he's faithful. Right? That's how Paul uses the Old Testament to show to Jews God's grace. Leviticus does not contain the mystery, but it talks about God's faithfulness and his mercy, his long-suffering. And we're learning this with tears in our eyes because Jerusalem, people are killed here. And it's not because God's hateful and vengeance. It's because he, he did what he said he was going to do. He had already warned them, right? Then they give you a different perspective on what God did. He just did what he said he was going to do, and it was man that was the wicked one. We didn't believe him. They didn't believe him. Right? And you just said that. Le Leviticus 26. Let's go back here and look at some good news. Because Leviticus 26, at the very end of the chapter here, in verse 40, 39 and 40, it says, You'll perish among the heathen, and the land of your enemies shall eat you up. And they that are left of you, that's called a remnant, shall pine away in their iniquity in your enemies' lands. That's Daniel and those guys. And also the iniquities of their fathers shall they pine away with them. Verse 40, if Here's the last if statement, right? If they shall confess their iniquities and the iniquities of their fathers with their trespass, which they trespass against me, and that also they have walked contrary to me, that I also have walked contrary to them and have brought them into the land of their enemies, if then their uncircumcised hearts be humbled and they then accept the punishment of their iniquity, then will I remember my covenant, my promise, with Jacob and also my covenant with Isaac and my covenant with Abraham will I remember and I will remember the land. God says, if they confess their sins... I will remember my promises. Daniel, who's in the fifth punishment in Babylon, reads Jeremiah, reads Leviticus, and says, now's the time. And read Daniel 9, folks. Daniel 9. Daniel kneels down and says, I confess to you, Lord, my sins and those of my fathers, and we're in an enemy land, and you brought us here, and you told us you were going to do this, and you're faithful to have done that, but we're sorry. We want to go back to the land. And Daniel prays that, and Daniel gets revelation and Ezra and Nehemiah bring a remnant back to the land, just like God said that he would. Israel continues to disobey God, however, and you read Malachi and you read Zechariah, and you see that they continually disobey him, even when he brings them back as a remnant under the rule of their enemies. And so during the days of Jesus, they, he comes under the rule uh, of the Romans in Israel, okay, underneath that fifth punishment, which hasn't yet been complete. And what Jesus preaches with John the Baptist is repent and confess your sins, or what? Christ will come back with wrath, right? That's Leviticus 26, folks, right? Jesus taught in Matthew, John the Baptist taught in Matthew, Leviticus 26, it's no different. The new thing in Matthew was Jesus showed up, <laughs> right? And who's Jesus? Yes, the Savior, yes, the Redeemer, yes, the Deliverer, but also the Judge and the Avenger, right? Jesus came first to save, he'll come again for what? Vengeance according to Leviticus 26. And he said, I've come here to preach to you to repent so that when I return, you're not part of my wrath. That's what he preached. That's his message. So those that believed in Jesus were part of the faithful remnant if they confessed their sins. So what does his disciples teach in 1 Peter and 1 John? 1 John 1, 9. If you confess your sins, he is just to forgive us our sins. Right? That's Leviticus 26, verse 40. 1 John is not talking about the mystery. It's not talking about some new information. It's quoting Israel's covenant. Peter, James, and John were the 12 apostles of Israel. There were 12 because there were 12 tribes of Israel. Right? The new information Christ revealed to the apostle Paul, where nowhere does Paul say, confess your sins and God is just to forgive you. He says, Christ bore the sins of all of you. He died for your sins so that you could be forgiven. He says, Christ has already forgiven you. He is 4.32. Trust Christ's finished work, and you are forgiven. You're complete. All your transgressions are taken away. You're crucified, so death has no more power over you. right? And you can have salvation now. It was an unprecedented revelation about God's grace and salvation offered to the world apart from Israel's covenant. Because the only way salvation comes to Leviticus 26 is the very end when everyone confesses. right? You don't want to have to be pushed to confess, folks, <laughs> for Israel's kingdom. You want right now to admit that I'm the ungodly sinner and I need Christ to save me. Or else there'll be a time where God's wrath is poured out and men hide themselves in caves. And what he's trying to do is get them to repent and confess. Right? 
That's what Peter and John were preaching. God will remember something in verse 26. He'll remember the promises to the fathers. And Jesus came as a minister of the circumcision to confirm the promises made to the fathers. Right? He'll remember the land. And Hebrews 13 is all about Israel remembering the land, or God remembering the land and the city. He will not cast them away, Leviticus 26 says. And Hebrews 10, 25 says, cast not away your confidence. God will not cast away you. Okay? And he says, I will be their God. Just like Revelation 21, where finally when the kingdom comes, in Revelation 21, he says, I will be your God and you'll be my people. Leviticus 26 is fulfilled in Revelation with Israel, right? So, sorry I went over a little bit there, folks. Leviticus 26, I thought it's a fascinating study. It's, uh, it's fun information to study about Israel's covenant. Not so fun to hear about the destruction and the death and the punishment that comes at man's disobedience, but it's a reminder of God's faithfulness. And we see the connection, hopefully, with even the New Testament passages and how those things are, are teaching what Leviticus says, except for the epistles of the mystery which are, are Paul's epistles, which don't declare Leviticus. Uh, they speak of something unheard of since the world began, which is more glorious. It's more excellent. Okay. All right. Any questions, any comments about the entire Bible? <laughs> there, was, there was a chart lesson about the chart. That's right. Sorry about that. I didn't have time to draw. Yeah. That would have been a good one, though. All right. Well, if not, let's say a prayer. God, we thank you for books like Leviticus. We thank you for communicating to us your righteousness, your holiness, your faithfulness, so that you could reveal your grace and we can believe it. We thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you for the, the love and joy you commend through your, what you've done throughout history. We thank you for the, the continuing mercy and long-suffering you have towards this wicked, present, evil world and towards us. We thank you that you created us a new creature and that we're able to praise you today according to the revelation of the mystery. We thank you for the folks here in your church, and uh, we, we pray that we would come to a greater understanding of you and your will. Amen.